So today's case, a winner via YouTube poll, I guess. Uh, the Springfield 3 finished with like 37% of the votes. And then uh, Lizzie Borden was second, close second, like 34%. And then Sam Shepard and then Molly Bish. So hence I'm doing Springfield 3. Very interesting case I've been researching the last couple of days on and although again once you I believe take out all the noise it's fairly easy I guess especially when you have non-biased eyes that's why it's so important to not go down rabbit holes and look at all these things for me I just want the facts the crime scene photos if there is a crime scene not too much on suspects, victimology, location, time of day, weather, the geographical area. You focus in on that stuff. The crime tells you where you should be looking. And that's what we're going to do today for Springfield 3. So for you that do not know, I'll give a brief introductory kind of like I always do it was a missing persons case times three from Springfield Missouri which is close to Branson I believe maybe 45 minutes away from Branson I used to have my conferences for the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases we held them I think at least two maybe three years in a row in Missouri so I met a few detectives from there that came to our conference also remember a woman who came there uh, she had contacted me earlier wanted to come of course I didn't charge her anything and I let her attend all the night's events and stuff her small daughter was kidnapped abducted from her home why they slept and was found murdered uh, that case always stuck with me a great detective who solved that case uh, I spoke with about it as well just tremendous respect for him I'll have to do that case one day that was kind of heart-wrenching as well but let's get back to Springfield 3 and this disappearance happened on June 6th, going into June 7th, 1992. And that was very um, jogging to my memory because in 1992, I graduated high school exactly like they did on, I think it was June 6th that they graduated high school as well. And June 7th is my birthday. 19, and so June 7, 1992, I was two months from going into the Marine Corps and I was partying it up and having a great time with my high school friends and I remember it well. So that stuck out to me. So on June 6, 1992, these guys graduated high school just like I did. Susie Streeter and who was age 19 and Stacy McCall who was age 18 and that night they did what I did and I assume half if not three quarters of 
high school folks do when they graduate they went to a party went to a couple parties actually so we're going to start this there I don't want to give a too drawn out of a timeline because again it brings noise where you don't need noise we're going to focus on the facts I just did a video on the psychics I see psychics were involved in this of course I don't pay them no attention um, I did read some of comments in that and it cracks me up you know when some people say I don't believe in psychics either but this one I just find that amusing uh, no, not just one, and none of them. But, again, you, you believe what you want to believe. I believe what I want to believe. So, Stacy McCall and Susie Streeter graduate high school. They go to some parties at night. Victimology shows that they are both very well liked. They are both responsible people. Both have jobs. They're friends. They've been friends their whole life. And Susie may have a little bit of a tougher side to her, maybe in a way. Not that she got in fights or anything. You know, her boyfriends are more, it appears from what I heard and researched, a little bit on the rougher side. And in fact, one of her boyfriends a few months earlier, I'm going to say in February 92, was arrested for breaking into a mausoleum and stealing the gold caps from somebody's teeth and selling them at a pawn store. Ah. He was a teenager. Teenagers do some incredibly stupid things. I'm guilty of that as well. I'm certainly not guilty of desecrating a grave of all the crazy shit that I did in high school and believe me there was quite a bit of it robbing a mausoleum or desecrating a loved one's grave never entered into my mind that takes a special kind of stupid a special kind of ignorance as well but again, I digress. Susie Streeter's car was used in the commission of that crime. Now, there's some talk that she didn't know what was going on. Uh, but I believe, I want to say she was the driver. So she had to, if she was the driver, she had to have some sort of knowledge about that. Is that motive to end up? Kidnapping Susie Streeter, her best friend Stacy, and Susie's mom. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to break into a mausoleum, take somebody's skull, remove their teeth, yeah, you, there's something about you that would make you capable, in my mind, of doing something like this. Susie Streeter gave up that information. That's how they were able to arrest this individual and his friend and she was set to testify in court against them when they disappeared and I'm not sure how long but it was coming up that's certainly a motive and I, first thing I immediately thought of was the Carrie Culberson case remember that one if you don't remember go back and check my weeks long uh, look at that Carrie Culberson case where her boyfriend Vince Doan was Con well, arrested of hitting her with a space heater and putting a gash somewhere in her head. He had abused her. He had beat her up. He eventually did kill her, even though her body was never found, and some people don't believe that he did it. Um, the prosecution's motive at trial was Vince silenced her from testifying against him. Now, I don't necessarily believe that. I think Vince killed her out of jealousy and anger and possession that he couldn't control her and that is why but again this is what I thought of when I heard about these two idiots that broke into 
the mausoleum stole the gold fillings. And then when they interviewed the guy, he says, yeah, I hope those bitches are dead. Again, not a lot of cooth there. Special kind of stupid, special kind of ignorance. And if I had a guess, I don't know. This happened, what, 30 years ago? Man, it's been that long since I graduated high school. Hard to believe. But I'm thinking if that kid today looked back at that kid when he was 18 and said that and did those things, I'm guessing he feels like a complete and utter idiot. I hope that he does. And I bet he doesn't believe that today. But make no mistake, those three individuals that went missing on June 6th going into June 7th in Springfield, Missouri, Cheryl Levitt, her daughter Susie Streeter, and her friend Stacy McCall, they are deceased. Now how do I know that? Am I Sylvia Brown? Am I a psychic? No. So I won't say 100%. But once we get into what I feel happened and why it happened, remember that why is always the most important thing to me. You got to know why. What was the motive? What was the cause? What was the reaction? And how do we get there? That's what's important. I need a drink. And no, it's not moonshine or alcohol. You know, I had this stupid comment that somebody said you really shouldn't be doing unsolved cases with alcohol behind you man remember when I was talking about a special kind of stupid <sighs> what does unopened yeah, this is a souvenir. I told you I got that from the FBI when I left their unit. They gave me a bottle of Jack Daniels. It's unopened. Over here, I have a bottle of uh, Chardonnay that Richard Walter from the VDOC Society gave me, unopened. And I have a bottle of Bell Me Bourbon, numbered whiskey, unopened, that... Carga 7 Pictures and the History Channel gave me after the premiere of the Zodiac Killer. I'm not drinking them. And even if I did, who gives a shit? <laughs> you know what I mean? What's that have to do anything with unsolved cases? People's idiotic comments. You know what it reminds me of? I, some of you older folks probably seen this, but a lot of younger folks have. It reminds me of Billy Jack. If I could be anybody, I'd probably want to be Billy Jack. Okay, Billy Jack will always wore a denim jacket. He was a half uh, Indian, half white guy, Vietnam War veteran. They had, had movies, um, you know, that he made. He was a character, um, not a real person. He wore his Indian hat, and he would just get so frustrated. You know, I remember the shot, he had a scene where he beat up some people that were bullying these Native American kids, dumping flour on them, trying to make them white. And he walked in on that and he's like, I try to control this violent temper of mine, but sometimes I just go berserk. Billy Jack. Tom Laughlin, who played him, I salute you. I understand where you're coming from because I feel that way a lot. Anyhow, let's get to this case, right? I know that's what you're thinking. And I always do, but for some reason I'm just digressing today. Maybe it's the weather. It's horrible weather, rainy. I can't do nothing but cold cases. And so that's what I've been diving into. And I'm crazy over this case because although I think I might have it figured out there's some loopholes that throw me off and I will let those loopholes up to you to decide so June 6 two girls go to a couple parties come home 
Okay, this is where this case starts. They were supposed to spend the night in Branson at a hotel. That fell through. They were going to stay at their friend Janelle's place, but she had too many relatives over at her house because it's a party. It's graduation. Everybody's having a party. So Susie Streeter has her car and um, Stacy McCall has her car. They are going to, now, now this is why I say this, it starts here. Because at 2.20, I want to say, in the morning, a witness, unbiased, says, at this party, I heard Susie say, hey, follow me home to Stacy. Stacy said, okay. They leave the party and they go home. In this scene here, or this picture, you see the cars parked there. The first one, um, up front, closer uh, to the house, in that driveway is Susie's, and the one behind is Stacy's. So that corroborates, number one, that they made it home. And not only did they make it home, but they made it home just as the witness said, right? Stacy following Susie. Because if not, the cars would be flip-flopped. No. And it also confirms more than likely that they came from that direction. Now, supposedly that's not where Susie parked her car. Do I take stock in that? No. There has been speculation that there was another car parked in Susie's spot that when she got home that night, therefore she didn't park there. I don't believe that. I believe that they came from that direction and they pulled into that side of that circular driveway and parked. If they would have came home from the other direction, I bet Susie would have parked right behind her mom's car, which was in the carport. Okay? So everything is jiving so far. Now that is the last time that these three women are seen alive. The mom's in the house. The mom had gotten a phone call um, around 9.30 that night and she was redecorating, putting up some wallpaper, refurbishing a dresser of some sort, and that's the last time she was heard from. The next day they were supposed to go to a water park with their friends. It never happened. The friend kept calling, nobody answered. She ends up going to the house with her boyfriend. Now, what the boyfriend discovers is very important. Well, what both of them discover. As they're walking up onto the porch, they discover glass on the front stoop. That glass, from all intent and purposes, is from a globe that covers the light bulb on the front porch. He doesn't think much of it because he doesn't know anything's up, right? So he sweeps it up. Why he sweeps it up is also very important. The girl is barefoot. The friend is barefoot who goes to check on them. She doesn't want to, you know, step on glass. So he sweeps it up. Remember that, okay? That's going to come back later in my assessment. They enter the house. Nobody's there. While she's in there looking around, phone rings. Somebody's uh, saying some explicit sexual things on the phone. She hangs up. They call back. They say it again. She describes it as like a teen voice. A lot of people put stock into that. Do I? No. I think it's a prank call. Prank calls used to happen all the time. Not so much more when we all have cell phones, but they did. I've been known to place a few prank calls when I was 14, 13 years old. You know, not in that nature. Ours were more like, hey, is your refrigerator running? Yeah, we'll go catch it. Stupid stuff like that. But I don't believe that this was had anything to do with the disappearance. So the boyfriend and friend leave. Stacy's mom, who believes that she is staying at 
the friend's house, calls the friend's house because Stacy hasn't gotten in contact with her, and people are starting to get worried. No, Stacy's not here. She went to spend the night with um, Susie. Mom doesn't think too much of that because, hey, she's 18. She just graduated. I'm going to let her you know, do what I want, but she hasn't called me yet, and it's kind of concerning. She eventually goes over to the house as well. When she goes in, and again, they go into the house. It's kind of odd, right? You go into a house, you don't, you're kind of breaking into somebody's house. The door is unlocked, which is another key clue. But you're, you're concerned about your, your daughter. So you're going in. She notices her, her daughter's clothing, and this is, this is very important, that she had worn that night, folded neatly, placed on top of her shoes. Now that's the only clothes that she had left that night with. So the only thing missing is she had a yellow shirt on and her underwear. That's, that's going to be key, okay? So remember that. They finally call the police. They notice, police police come and, and they're looking around. There's a lot of people in the house now. There's at least 10 people, which, yeah, it destroys evidence. It does these things. But you don't know what you got, right? Hindsight's always 2020. These cops, these people in the house, they're just trying to locate they don't they don't know they have a kidnapping an abduction they don't know if they left on they don't know nothing so I don't fault people for this okay the boyfriend cleaning up the glass people want to get on him saying he tampered with evidence are you out of your mind the guy didn't know okay he's doing a good thing and you want to ridicule him <sighs> So, one of the things that the police notice is, a, is something that I can't make sense of. All three girls' purses are in Susie's room, all together, like lined up. Now, I look at a picture of it, and it doesn't look like it's lined up to me, but they do look like they're all together. I don't know what to make of that. I have a hard time believing that the mom would keep her purse in her daughter's bedroom with the other two purses. Again, some victimology would tell you that. Somebody knows where she would normally keep her purse at. So why are all three of those purses together? I don't have an answer for that. I can give some guesses, but that, that's all they would be. Um, they're gone. That's it. That's your clues. That's it. Never seen again. It's been 30 years. No blood. No struggle. Three purses. Clothes folded, broken globe, I call it a globe, glass covering on the outside porch. So what can we make out of it? Well, some days later, a neighbor came forward and said that she saw a man looking into her neighbor's window. Now this neighbor only lived three houses down. I think that's what I wrote down. Three houses down from 1717 East Delmar, which you can see here. And that neighbor observed a peeping Tom at 1.15 a.m. The night of these this disappearance. Folks, that's not a coincidence. 
okay? There are coincidences. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the suspects, later on, and I'll talk about him, worked in the same dealership, auto dealership, as Stacy McCall's father. Juicy, right? That's a coincidence. That's a coincidence. I know it doesn't sound like it. In this case, it's a coincidence. A peeping Tom at 1.15 in the morning within the time frame that these three individuals disappear three houses down is not a coincidence another individual came forward um, I want to say it was like 17 days later it was some time later it wasn't years and said I seen Susie Streeter, one of the missing per people, pull next door. I was out on my front porch at 5.53 in the morning. She pulled in. She was driving. It looked like she was crying. I heard a male voice tell her, don't do anything silly. Just turn around. And she backed up. Now, apparently, this was a one way street. Now, I looked for this in this aerial map and I didn't see it. And they were protecting this person's information so they didn't release her name or her address. So I wasn't able to find it. I really would like to see where that house is. But is that site incredible? It was a van that she was driving. Well, it just so happens that a number of people came forward and said that they saw a van. Now, it varied in color. Some said brown. Some said light green, celery colored, like this one. The exact year and model that this witness saw. Um, do I put stock into that? I do. Now, without knowing that witness... See, when you have a witness like that who says they saw something, uh, you want to vet them out. And by vet them, I mean, what's their background? Okay. Now, I've heard attorneys all the time, both prosecutor and defense, say, I wish, I wish all my witnesses were nuns or priests. But that's not the case. A lot of times in homicides, shootings, your your witnesses are drug dealers, prostitutes, or people that have a shady past. That's just the way it is. Um, so I would want to know, but that doesn't mean that they that they lie. Okay, let's make that clear. But it gives you kind of a moral compass of which way that compass is going to point, whether you're going to believe them or not. If this person is known to be a liar and throw themselves and wanting to be the center of attention, then you have to look at it a little bit differently. But because of how I think this crime occurred, I believe this person. And I'll, I'll tell you why I believe them, but a little later when I tell you what I think happened. So... This happened at 5.53 a.m. That's what this witness remembers. And that fits the time frame. Remember, they went missing between, let's say, 2.30 in the morning when they got home. And I guess 7.30 when they're not answering the phone calls. Or at least at noon when the first people showed up. Or, But we can narrow that back further in time because of a piece of evidence and that is the globe from the light this light this porch light was reportedly on there's only one reason for that light to be on that's because something happened at night on that front porch I'm not saying a disturbance took place Uh, see, I want to get in to tell you what I think happened. Uh, 
but I don't want to do that until the very end when I get some of these other things out. But remember that porch light being on, it's important, and door unlocked. At some time later, the police get a, a call about an individual named Robert Cox. The call, I believe, comes from a victim of Robert Cox. In 1976, Robert Cox uh, murdered a woman, and I believe she bit off his tongue. And he had to go to the emergency room, and that's eventually how he ended up, I believe, getting caught. He is released, and he's able to get out of prison after murdering somebody. Where does Robert Cox happen to be on June 6, 1992? You guessed it. Springfield, Missouri. The parents alerted the police that he was in that area and he could be responsible. They looked into him. He has an alibi. His girlfriend says that um, he spent the night at his parents' house that night which throws up a big red flag to me right away, but police say okay, and I guess they interview the parents. They say, yeah, he was here, and she says, the next day we got up early and went to church. There's, you know, I guess if I was the police department, I would have, well, I guess they didn't get this message or, you know, this tip for years later. I would say you go to that church and verify that he was there, but, you know, so many uh, years later or months, maybe that was impossible because people wouldn't remember. Fast forward a couple years, Robert Cox is arrested in Texas for holding a gun to a 12 year old girl's head during some sort of robbery, which I admit I did not look into the specifics of that and I should have for this video because I want to see if there's any similarities to what happened there obviously into this case. But it renewed interest in the Springfield Three. So the police now go and interview him they interview his girlfriend again, but this time the girlfriends, they're not together anymore. Remember how I always say, you know, cool cases work sometime to a disadvantage, but also it's advantageous to detectives because loyalties change. And in this case, it did change, and she said they did not go to church that day, and she had no idea where he was the night before on June 6th going into 7th, 1992, that he wasn't with her. Another red flag, right? Robert Cox states that he doesn't know what happened to the Springfield Three, but he does know that they're dead, all three of them. And he knows this, it's not a theory. But that's about as much as they get out of him. Then he had told the police that, you know, when his mom died, maybe he would tell them a little bit more. A lot of people say that Robert Cox is just playing around with law enforcement and, you know, keeping him on the hook, kind of like Ted Bundy did, you know. There's other people that believe Robert Cox is not and should not be a suspect in this case. Um, I believe that he certainly should not be discounted. And we'll get into why. So let me get into why I think, or what I think happened based off the very limited evidence. Now again, this is speculation, but it's speculation based off of evidence. It's also based off of inductive and deductive reasoning 
in order to come to a likely scenario or conclusion. A couple things stand out to me. Let's do them in order, okay? The peeping Tom at 115. That's troublesome. That's troublesome. Two, the broken globe that surrounds the light. My initial response to this and the initial thought was the offender broke that going into the house. Now, what do I mean by that? People say, well, the victim, mom, would not answer the phone or answer the door if somebody knocked. It had to be somebody they know. I vehemently disagree with that. If somebody knocks on your door, I don't care if it's 2 in the morning or not. You get up to answer it. You don't lay in bed and cower. Now, all, think of this. It's also graduation night. People partying. Kids all over the place. Your kids and her friend, your kid and friend, just came home. It's, it's not like it's a normal school night, is what I'm trying to say. It's a party night. Don't you think that one of the kids could have got up and got the door thinking it's a friend of theirs, something like that, to that extent? Um, so it being somebody they know, no, it's not. I don't believe that at all. I believe this is a complete stranger or an acquaintance of some sort. You know what I mean? Not, nobody that they knew. Nobody that they knew personally that would that they would let in, put it that way. But I initially thought that what happened was the person knocked on the door or the, he tried the door, whatever it was, and when the mom or the daughter, whoever it was, that got up to answer the door, they turn the first thing you do. What's the first thing you do, folks? You turn on the outside light at two in the morning, three in the morning, whatever it is, to see who it is. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's exactly what happened. So they turn on the light, they open up the door, even if it's just a crack. And maybe they didn't even have time to say anything. The first thing that the offender does is smashes out that light. But the problem I have with that now is while I'm looking at crime scene, it, you know, I guess you can call it crime scene photos, although they're just photos. Is this photo right here? Now, do you see anything odd about it? This is obviously taken before this incident occurred. What I noticed is there is no globe around that light. Now, does that... Now, I'm sure police honed in on that. I hope that they did. How... I... I because of it not being there, I would have to assume that Miss Levitt bought one to put there. But did she? You know, how do we know that that's where it was, the glass was from? I, I guess I, I guess I shouldn't think that way. It, it should have, it more than likely did come from there. But could it have just fallen out? I think, see, this is why I talk about when you start thinking too much. Okay? I should just leave it at, hey, this picture caught my attention because there is no globe surrounding that light bulb. I should, have, I should stick with my original, original thought is the offender knocked that down. And I will. For this purpose, I'll, he knocks that down, but it does not bust the light. But he can't take the time to knock the light out as well, right? He's got to deal with one person at least. Now maybe two, three are coming to the door. His object is to get inside, okay? So if he knocks that light down, he gets inside. What's his reasoning for wanting to get inside so bad? 
number one, you're, you're out on the street, okay? You don't want people to see you. Granted, there's not people walking around probably. It's three in the morning, four in the morning, whatever it is. You want to get inside and control the situation. And I believe the offender did that. What, um, what takes place inside is that this offender, I'm 90% sure I would go that high to say he has a gun. And he is controlling the situation. This offender has a criminal history of robbery, um, possible abduction. What I'm trying to say is he is not a novice to what he's doing. Now, how can I say that? You know, some people just arbitrarily say that because it sounds good. I don't like that. You have to justify it. What I believe is that he, look at this picture here. This is a, a picture, I think it was in 2007, of the home. And look at the coverage that the, that tree provides compared to this picture, okay, when the leaves are off. So the leaves are on right now. This is in 2000, uh, or 1992, but it's June. So that house is blocked. By all intent and purposes, if that, I'm sure that tree was still there, it provides good cover for an experienced individual who is casing out homes, a peeping Tom, not for the purpose of, of robbery, for the purpose of sexual assault. It's not his first time in that area, okay? He's in that area because he's comfortable in that area. Look at this overall view. He can park at many different places. This offender had to have driven a vehicle, right? All three of the victim's vehicles are there, so he had to drive. I, I'm guessing he drove a van because what better, you know, you're abducting three people. You're not going to do that in a Dodge Dart. I guess you could, but unlikely. He was in that area before. He's looking in houses for potential victims. People that look easy, appeal to him. That's very important in a sexual assault. Okay? These are two very good looking females. And I, I pause because I, I, I think of the mother as well. And I don't think that this is a... People are trying to figure out who was targeted. Somebody had to be targeted. I'm not so sure... Yes, they were targeted. But not in a stalking type of scenario, if that makes sense. Meaning, he didn't see this girl at... Dairy Queen and then graduation then at a party and he kept following her until they got home. No. This offender had been in the area looking in homes trying to find a good victim. He found it. Okay. And why I think he's a uh, has a criminal past is because he sees three vehicles in the driveway and it doesn't deter him, folks. It doesn't deter him. A novice, I believe, would have turned around and chose another home or went home and, you know, got rid of the fantasy altogether, take the fantasy another night. It did not deter him. And he goes in. Now remember I say him. Obviously, it's a male. And something else that I'm... I'm fairly adamant about is that it was a single offender. Oh, now everybody's going crazy. How could one person, I get this all the time, how could one person do this to multiple people? Folks, we see it time and time again. Okay? Richard Speck controlled what? Eight, nine nurses all in the area. Okay? BTK killer. 
when he first family that he killed the Oteris, single offender, a whole family he controlled with a gun and a knife. There was another one, and I just lost the name of it. I want to say not the McShay family, McStay, I believe. He uh, killed somebody, maybe in Yellowstone or something like that. Three people, a mom, a daughter, and a friend, just like this. It's very easy, especially when you're an experienced criminal, to control three people with a weapon. It's very simple. Okay? Just put it right the gun right to one of the kids' head. Hey, you scream, I'm going to kill her right here. Right here. Try me. That's all it'll take. And you're going to you're going to comply. Now, what do we know about the time frame? Okay, we know that they were inside that house when this abduction occurred. There was makeup removal stuff, the folded clothes. Remember that? Um, the TV being on, that Susie slept with the TV on, the volume was down. That is very curious to me, her, the volume being down. She always slept with the TV on from what I researched, but what about the volume? I want to know whether she had that volume up at a normal level or turned down. Because if she had it normally at a normal level and she slept with it this way but in this instance when they come to the house and find it empty the volumes down that makes me believe she heard something and she sat up in bed and turned down the television or whatever it is why is that television turned down back to the offender I originally believed and I, and I, I think I still do I have to know more about this. I looked at the back of their house, and there is a back door. But it seems there's a fence around it. I would like to know whether that fence had a door in it as well. Because remember I said the folded clothes, clothes of Stacy's was very important. Because they are laying on her shoes. She exited that house in her yellow shirt, in her underwear. What is that indicative of? To me, that's somebody that's in bed. That's what she wore to bed. Now, her mom would know that. Her mom would know how she went to bed, whether she wore a long t-shirt, just like a lot of girls do. I believe that she was in bed. But when she's marched out at gunpoint, one right after another, mom, daughter, friend, in a line. I don't believe that they went out that front door. Why? So can anyone guess? The broken glass. Would that not have cut their feet if they went out that front door barefoot? Certainly would have. I mean, it was shattered so much that the boyfriend who came earlier cleaned it up, right? So that got me thinking about a back door. And I, that's what my thought was. Usually people will use ingress and egress the same manner. If you come in one way, you go out that way because you know that it's safe. You know that it's been there. But that isn't always the case. Um, especially if you think about it, if he, if the offender broke that globe, he knows it created a noise. So he wants to get inside, and he, he knows that he doesn't really want to go back out that way. Hence the back door. So the back door makes sense to me that that would be the way that they would be herded out. Or else I believe that somebody, you have three people that would have stepped on glass. Okay? If you're in a line, think about it. You're in a line and you're walking. Let's say, you know, you're not going to see what the first person sees. The first guy, the offender, um, I guess he wouldn't be the first one in line. He'd be in the back pushing you out the door with a weapon. I don't see all three 
females jumping over a pile of broken glass. I think they would be too frightened. I think they would be half groggy. And they somebody, one of the three, would have stepped on broken glass in their bare foot, which would have led to blood. And there was none. Because of that, I think it's possible they went out the back door. Now again, if that where does that back door go? Okay, I do see some businesses. See, this person didn't park their their van, their vehicle anywhere near that house. It's somewhere else. But it's it's somewhere close that he can get to. He's not going to parade three people right down the middle of the street. You know, it's going to be through the back through trees, you know, so forth, but if that is a solid constructed fence with no door to get to the outside of that property, well, then I have no choice but to believe that he probably did somehow go out the front door and they didn't step on the glass. I don't see him taking them out the back door and then making them jump over a fence. Depends on how high the fence is, I guess, but... Uh, I'm not sure. So, that that's what I think happened. Now, why? Well, it's certainly a planned sexual assault. And it was planned more than likely by this peeping Tom. Uh, and he was, look, he was trying to select a victim. And he took three of them, the, the offenders from the area. Uh, maybe, you know, but from the area, I don't mean he's a local. He, he could have just lived there six months. Probably somewhere in that neighborhood. And he took them somewhere where he felt comfortable, just like Ted Bundy would do. Take them to the woods where no one's going to hear them. Um, take them to a house. In all intent and purposes, they're dead. They might not have been killed that night. Uh, I'm sure he took turns or times, you know, sexually assaulting each one. Because that, that was the reason for this. Make no mistake about it. It was a sexual assault. And then he killed him. That's my belief. Again, that's that's just based on training and experience. And from what I see, I, I, I don't see them being held captive. At least of today. It, they, he could have held them captive for you know, a number of weeks, maybe months. But eventually he ended up, he would have killed them. That's my belief. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. But again, not going down rabbit holes and just looking with unbiased eyes, kind of at the crime scene, very little clues there, but there are some. You know, they definitely did not run away. Definitely did not run away. So anyone that says that, they're out of their minds. You know, her leaving her cigarettes there reminded me of the Dale Kerstetter case that we had talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, they just they wouldn't do that. The purses, I wanted to get back to that. That threw me in a, a weird space a little bit. Not sure what to make of that. What I what I think may have happened is that when when something like this happens and you're one person, the first thing that you need to do is you have to round up whoever's home and get them in one room. That's what BTK did. You, you have to. Who's in the house? He, you know, he peeping Tom, he may have known there was only, hey, this is a nice house. Not nice house as in concealed. It sits back a little bit, has that big tree surrounded. This is a good target. And there's at least, he probably seen at least one person there. He may have been outside when they pulled up and seen him go in. That would fit with the timeline. He sees two girls. He's not deterred that there's two, three vehicles there. You know, he's going to go in. He's going to round them up, put them in a room. Um, he could have used some sort of ruse uh, when he got inside. Listen, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to take you on a trip. You know, I'm going to let you go as long as you cooperate. So, you know, I'm going to get your purses, put them there round up everything, make them feel comfortable, like everything's okay, and then 
you know, hey, let's go. Well, what about our purses? F the purses. Let's go. It's time. Who knows? Nobody knows what went inside that house, right? Not even these little psychics that think they know everything. Nor do I, uh, as an experienced detective who tries, and I've worked on hundreds and hundreds of cases and missing persons. All you can offer is what you see, okay? And not see as in a vision, but what other cases have told you, what experience, what training, what other serial killers, um, assault victims tell you happened. That's very important to take what they say they did and apply that to other cases. All right, so in my notes, I have a star next to Van Sightings Credible. Now, why do I say that? Just, just based off of the person saying it. Remember, I, I talked about whether the person's credible that's given the information. But the reason I think it's credible is because it's my belief that it was a single offender. And because of that, making one of the victims drive your vehicle becomes paramount. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, how do you control three individuals in your car when you have to drive? Right? Very difficult. So what do you do? You make one of the victims drive. You drive. You do anything funny. I'm in the back here with your mom, with your friend. I will shoot them in the head and not think twice. Do you understand? Yes, she's crying. So I believe that that's exactly what that witness saw. And I believe she did see it. The door unlocked, the TV on, we talked about that. The front porch light smashed when gaining entry. And it still being on in the afternoon. I had someone local, um, and I talked about that. But the reason I had local initially written down here is because she just moved into that house. I thought she had just moved in like that month. She had moved in, in into April. So, you know, April, May, and the beginning of June, this happened. Um, the convenience store clerk. There was a clerk that came forward at this 7-Eleven type of place who said that he saw Susie and Stacy come in around 10, 10, 30, and they were in like a brown vehicle, two separate vehicles, but he was sure it was them. But all the friends that were at the party said, absolutely not. She never left the party. And then that same clerk said at 2 o'clock in the morning, Susie's mom, the victim, came in looking for Susie. I don't believe it. I don't believe that at all. I don't think the evidence at the house tells you that. Uh, I, I, again, witnesses can be wrong. And maybe he is right, okay? But from what I see, I believe he's mistaken. The Stacy wearing the yellow t shirt and underwear confirmed to me that she was in bed when this happened. I'm going to guess that this happened between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. I could probably narrow it down to that. And that fits the driver at 5.53 a.m. being seen by a neighbor. The way the cars are parked, as you can see here, again, confirms that McCall followed Streeter just like the witness said. I believe that. To go a little bit further, I mean, I can see that S Susie Streeter's car is parked a little bit into the grass area on the right side. So it leads me to believe maybe that she could have been intoxicated a little bit, but maybe she was just a bad driver. It was night. It ain't that far off, but it's just something I noticed. 
the shoes um, and the stepping on the glass. I said that. Peeping Tom at 1.15 a.m., three houses down. I think that's paramount. At 2.20, they left the Kirby house to go home. That fits all the timeline. Um, Robert Cox. We'll get back to him. There was information that... And I'm not sure where the information came from. But years later, they said that they checked a parking garage for the three victims. A news reporter actually hired or brought in somebody to run a ground penetrating radar. Now if you're not familiar with them, let me tell you a little bit about them because uh, I am familiar with them. I have used them in missing person searches. So basically it's like a, say a, a lawn seeder. You know, it's something you push in front of you and it sends out radar under the ground and if it hits emptiness or shows abnormal movement by movement I mean movement of the soil things have been disturbed it will show that and this person ran it over a certain area and it came back with three abnormal spots well obviously that fits three bodies now the police have ruled this out supposedly because they said that and I didn't understand this that that parking garage was under construction during the time that the three went missing well to me that's the most opportunistic time and best place you know to put somebody so they have not dug that area up. Now I know there's a lot of red tape, BS, but you gotta dig that out, okay? It don't take much. You bring in a jackhammer, you grid out a 25 you know, foot wide area. If that's too big, then okay, condense it smaller. Go eight feet, eight feet by eight feet. Dig it out. And then pour concrete back over it if you find nothing. It's not hard. Okay? You have to do that. And ironically, the name of that parking garage, I think, was Cox. Again, don't go down that rabbit hole. I have down here the unknown subject. Uh, had a prior criminal history. I, he wasn't deterred by three vehicles. And he probably seen the two girls go in. So he's done this before. He wasn't deterred by it. Again, the house was more of a target. I can't say more of a target. The house and the victim were equally important to the offender. If this house would have sat out in the middle of town with... Street lights, I don't think that they would have chose it. But because of the location and because of the occupants, that's why it was chosen. And I have seen three vehicles didn't deter him. The purses, I have a question mark by. We talked about them. I don't have an answer for it. The stuff I said earlier is just a guess. Um, Robert Cox, he certainly... I think would fit this profile of a single offender who is experienced not only in violence but I, again I haven't looked him up I bet he has some sort of burglary prowling loitering charges in his past that's my guess he's somebody that I would certainly consider a suspect uh, I'm not sure how big Springfield is, but him being in that area, that alone, regardless of what he said in an interview, he's somebody that I would certainly, um, I'd look into a lot further. Those two teenage grave desecrators, no. 
they they don't fit my uh, my offender profile at all. So I would say no to that. Cox does fit it. Such an interesting case. Such a mysterious case. But that's what I see in this Springfield 3 disappearance. Uh, such a horrific tragedy. I watched an interview with uh, Stacy's mom and dad. And I wanted to get into the brother. You know, he was a suspect. He passed a polygraph. I never would have considered him a suspect at all. Now, I know you're supposed to start out... Um, with the family and all that and yeah maybe that's true but I didn't see it you know I would have done exactly what the police done though I would have rolled him out but he he didn't do this uh, he's an alcoholic supposedly at the time he had one time hit Susie mom disowned him if he was the offender everything would have happened right then and there in that house he wouldn't have abducted him. That makes no sense. And he would have done it at a time when Stacy wasn't there. That makes no sense. So, I feel bad for the brother. He never got to say goodbye to them properly. And it seems that they left on bad terms. And I'm always very sad when that happens. But the interview I watched with Stacy's mom and dad, especially the dad going to the bench that they had made for them, cleaning it off and sending them, he didn't cry or anything, but just his mannerisms, um, it was sad. I really felt for him. And of course the mom, you know, one of the things she said in one of her interviews that I remember that struck me was that you know, now she's talking about her daughter Stacy, and her, she's been gone more years than she was on this earth. And she said, you know, I have to either think that she's 45 years old somewhere on earth, or she's 18 year old in heaven. That's tough. Man, I feel bad for them. It's always about the victims' families. I can't stress that enough. I just can't. To me, it's almost, and I know this is an unfair statement, but if you do on this job for any other reason, it's the wrong reason. You know, I'm not just saying a police, you know, a cold case detective in general. If you're doing this work for any other reason than the victims and the victims' families, I think it's the wrong reason. That's just my opinion. And it might be an unfair or unpopular opinion, but you guys know me. I'm not afraid to give an unpopular opinion. I stand my ground on things. But that's just how I feel. That's how I feel. I felt bad for the detective. I was talking about this case in one of the interviews. I, he retired detective. I could see he really cared. Tough one, folks. So that's it for Springfield 3. I hope I did the victim's family and the victims some justice in trying to get this out there and give my opinion, and hopefully it'll spark some sort of new interest. Uh, we're closing in on 50,000 subscribers here all within a year, which I think is uh, pretty amazing. And hopefully this will get out to some people. Renewed interest. Who knows? Hopefully this case gets solved because it really needs solved for the victims and the victims' families. So until next time, as always, Maine's out.